guys. If you're new here, I hope you're not, right? I hope you're coming from the first part of this course, which I'm gonna link here. That was 12 hours that I took you guys through A to Z. Well, not really Z, A to W. <laughs> this is gonna be X, Y, Z in this video. And remember guys, this course is absolutely free. I'm not getting paid anything for this. In fact, I'm still hosting this course for you guys over on my platform. I'm linking it here or in the description, okay? It's more organized. I'm giving you guys books to help guide you in your journey. And there's an interactive community to help you grow as a developer. Now, if you already have Python experience and you came here for Pygame, this video is for you. But if you're new to Python, don't start here. Please, go back to the course that I curated for you to help guide you through this. It's going to make so much more sense. Okay, let's continue into Pygame. I hope you guys are getting immense value from this. If you are, do me a favor, hit that like button as that really helps this course reach more students. And subscribe if you're enjoying this kind of learning. Off to Pygame. Welcome back guys, here we are. Welcome to Pygame. We've made it this far and in the next few lessons you are going to be creating your very own 2D games in Python with Pygame. But first, I want to address why we will be using Pygame at the end of this course. Why not something else? Well, let's jump in and figure out why I've decided with Pygame. This course, it was created to build you all a strong foundation in Python. It's just like if we're building a house. If you skip over the foundation, your house will not last that long. We want to create a structure that's going to last for years to come that you can build upon. If we don't reinforce these foundational skills that we've been learning, all the more advanced topics that you will study in the future are going to become a struggle. And Pygame is one of the best possible ways to put your knowledge to the test because we will use everything you have learned throughout this course in a single application. It's like the ultimate test using everything you've learned from our conditional statements, our loops, creating your own functions, modules, classes, and lastly, lists. That's everything we've been studying. And all of that is going to go inside one application, a game, for example. Let's take a look at the structure of how any Pi game should go from top to bottom. Here we are. So in VS Code, your code should be structured to look something like this. At the very top, we begin with importing any needed modules. Obviously, we will be using Pygame, so I will be importing Pygame. But if there are other modules we need, like random or time, or maybe you create your own module, we need to import those at the top of our code. After all of our inputs, I will create all the variables that I will need for my game. To have easy access to these, I'm going to store these at the top of my code as well. Next up, we are going to have all of our game settings. So our width and height of the game screen, I'm going to create a game timer, and I'm going to give my game a name as well. This is all done at the top. Next up, we can begin, if needed, building our classes. We will do two games where you will need to be building classes. Our first full-fledged game is only going to be done with the creation of your own functions. Whether it's functions or classes, that can be done here. At the very end of our game is where we store and keep our main game loop. So every game, it doesn't matter if you're playing on Xbox, PlayStation, computer, 
every game has a main game loop, and that's going to go at the end of our code. Inside this game loop, we can store important events. What is an event on the computer? Well, it could be many different things. Quit is an event. If you press a key, if you release that key, if you use your mouse to click, right? Anything that can happen on the computer, that is what we are listening for with our game events. I would like to show you guys a basic breakdown. What do we really need in order to get our game ready for any of our code? Right here, I have the initial game set up for creating typically any Pi game. Now, it can be done in a few different ways, and I'm going to do it this way here. Now, there are many ways to create a Pi game. There is not just one way. What I'm trying to show you is a way that I have broken it down the most so you're able to truly understand what's happening. Are there more efficient ways? Are there ways that you could write shorter code? Absolutely. But you guys should feel comfortable writing your own code. If that means you write more, that's fine. As long as you get the results that you're looking for. Here is the form of the most basic setup for our game screen. We need to create a game screen before we put any other code. It's like your template. At the top, I import Pygame. You can do this two ways. The old way of just importing Pygame. If you do this directly after your imports, you must initialize Pygame and say pygame.init. And that gets Pygame working. If you choose the option of from Pygame import star, we do not need to put Pygame in it. As I begin making these games, I'm going to do them in both ways so you're able to see them. After we import our Pygame and start it, we then create a screen object. Now this screen is going to be the window that appears when you play your game. In order to set the width and height, we use a Pygame method called setMode. SetMode is linked to display, which is from the Pygame library. Now, it's important to note that setMode actually only takes one argument. That is why I have two sets of parentheses. I'm passing in one argument. I'm giving it a width and a height. That will be the size of your game screen. Next up, every game needs a name. In order to set our name, I can say Pygame Display Set Caption. Inside Set Caption, you will give a string of what you want your game to be called. You will be able to see this, and the players of your game will also be able to see this. So give it a good name. After we create our set caption and our screen, we create a clock. Now this is a different clock from the time module. Pygame needs an FPS. And if you're not familiar with cameras or videography, FPS is frames per second. So every second, how many frames is your game going through? Typically, if you go to the movies, a movie is in 24 frames per second. If you are watching an action sport, you might get up to 60 frames per second. When we're making Pi games, typically I'm going to choose an FPS of around 40 frames per second, up to 60 frames per second. By creating a clock object, I can then use this later in my code. All we're doing is just creating an FPS object called clock. Finally, in our game setup, if you have a background image, you could set the background as a solid color, which I will show you shortly. If you have an image, which most of our Pi games will have images, we can create a background object. In order to load images to Pi game, we use what's called image load. 
And inside, we would put the one argument of the image you are trying to load. This image must also be in VS Code to work. Many times, your images are too big. We need to scale those images. To do so, I have put transform scale. What do you want to scale? I want to scale the image that I'm loading. I can put the width and height that I'm trying to scale that image to after we load our image. Once we have our initial game set up, I then create my game loop. Now this is at the very end of my code. All the classes, all the functions, anything else we need will go in between these two. An initial setup for our game loop. I love to create a variable called run. It makes it easier to switch our game off when it's time. So initially I say run equals true. Then we create our loop while run. That just translates to while true, our game will keep running. The first thing that I'm doing within my loop is I want to get my background image on the screen. Where do I want it? I take my screen object, which is set here. I want to blit. Blit means paste. I want to paste something on my screen. What do you want to paste? I want the background image to be on my screen, and I want it to begin at the coordinates of 0, 0. That will bullet, that will paste our image onto the screen. And finally, the very last two lines of our code. Every time the loop runs, we want to update our display or update our screen. This update method from Pygame allows us to do just that. After we update, I can use the clock object that we created before, and I can say dot tick. Tick is a method. Inside, I could put an integer. So how many frames per second do you want this to update every time our loop runs? That's for you to decide. Great. Now that we have our initial setup, if you were to put this code into VS Code, and if you had an image, you would see a screen appear with that image in the background. We are off to a good start. Before we jump into actually creating a very short program just to put Pygame to the test, I would like to talk about events. Remember our key events. How do we set this up? This is an important step. As I mentioned before, we have many different types of events on the computer. We have our key press, key release, click, drag, quit, you name it, there is an event for it. Any game you are playing, no matter what, Xbox, computer, on your phone, the first thing the game actually checks for is to see if the player has quit the game. So that's going to be the first event in our games as well. To set up our events inside our game loop, inside our while loop, we create a special for loop. And what this is saying is for every event in Pygame, I want to get them all. Once we have this structure of the loop, I can then create a few conditions, and I can check for the event type. If the type of event is equal to quit, then we want to quit the game. I can use the special pygame quit function, and I can set my run variable to now equal false. This will end our game loop and cut our game. This is always the first event we want. Afterwards, it's up to you to decide what events is your game going to use. I can then create another condition for a new event type. In this example, I'm saying if the type of event is equal to a key down, a key press event, then Python can listen for a specific key. So, 
if the event type is a key down event, then I'm going to check if the event key is equal to the spacebar key. If it is, I can do whatever I want inside here. Now notice one point. All of our events, they are all capitalized, and this is important. These are called constant variables. When you're putting an event, it should be capitalized. I've put a few examples off to the right. Up top here are different types of events in Pygame. On the bottom are different keys that you could program in Pygame. Any key on the keyboard, you could program to do something. If you choose arrow keys, everything should be capitalized. If you choose any letters, the K for key is capitalized, and the letter you are programming is actually lowercase. You can also use numbers if you wish to do so. Some code that's used in Pygame. Now, I'm only going to be going over a few things here. Attached to this Pygame lesson, I have included a document of all the Pygame methods and functions I will be using in the games that we're doing here. If you want to do some more research, you should because there are endless methods that you can use and they're all programmed for a special task. These are just a few, and for reference, please view the document that's attached to this lesson. Up top, we create a screen variable. You can call this variable anything you want. It's popular to call it screen or window. If you're importing from Pygame import star, we can just use display set mode. And this creates our screen size with a width and height. Our clock object is keeping track of the time, which allows us to use an FPS in our game. You create your clock object. The value of that is time.clock. Now notice that clock is capitalized because it is a special class in Pygame. In order to use clock, you can link clock at the end of your loop with the tick method, giving it an FPS. Your game title is the set caption, and set caption takes a string of the name of your game. When you want to load an image into Pygame, there are two ways. The first way is you could create a variable, and to load an image, a JPEG or a PNG, I would say image.load, giving it the object that you want to load. Or if you want to scale an image you're loading, which I highly recommend. We use transform scale first, just like in my example. Within the scale method, then we are going to load our image and give that image a width and height. These are the two most common ways we will see to load an image. Lastly, our blit method. We link blit to our window, our screen object that we created, at the top of our code. Remember that blit just means paste. In order to get a picture or something on your screen, we need to blit that image to the screen. Now it takes two arguments. The first one is what do you want to paste on your screen? And the second argument is the location you want the image to start at. In the example, I have said zero, zero. I'm going to break it down further here soon on why I'm actually saying 0, 0. Now looking more at our events, we could do this a few ways. If you wanted to code your events in shorthand, I could create a variable called keys and it's equal to key.getPressed. This is listening for any time you press a key on the keyboard and it returns the current state of your keys. So key down is true, otherwise it's false. That way in all of our conditions, I could say if keys is equal to key up. So if I have pressed the up arrow key, then I could decrease my variable, which is my player's Y position by 15. Another thing that we're gonna be doing for our events 
is we will be programming keys, but I will also be giving it another expression within my condition. So if I press the S key and my player's Y position is less than 500, I want my player's Y to increase by 15. So now I can prevent my player from leaving the screen. Lastly, we could create another event if you press the spacebar and your player's X position is greater than zero, then you could subtract 15 from your player's X position. There are many different ways to program your events. Remember guys, the letter keys are lowercase. The arrow keys are uppercase. Great. Let's take a look at our first mini project that we're going to put together in a very short time just to kind of show you how Pygame works. Here we are. This is the first thing that I'm going to be putting together for you. All right. It is a simple put together application using two images. The airplane is able to move when we press the arrow keys and we have a background picture as well the airplane will not be able to leave the screen. It'll be bound by the borders. In the previous examples, you have seen me actually programming our events to zero, zero, all of the coordinates. And that's because Pygame is weird. Zero, zero is actually the top left of your game screen. If you increase X, you are going to the right of your screen. If you increase Y, you're actually going down your screen. So it works a bit opposite of what we are used to. Just remember that zero, zero is in the top left. If I want to go down, I want the plane to fly down, I would need to increase my Y to go down. You can see that my game has a title called Fly Me, which we will be giving, and we paste the background in first. And this is done in our loop after we create that background object. All right, using all the previous slides, I've given you files with the Pi Game lesson. Before you guys watch my next video in VS Code, Go back through the slides, use the notes that I've attached, and see if you can put together this quick Pi game setup. Remember, the airplane should move with your arrow keys and it cannot leave your screen. Give it a try. I'll see you guys in VS Code. Here we are in VS Code. The challenge that I gave you guys was to create your own mini intro project for Pygame that has two images and the airplane, the player, is able to move around freely but cannot leave the screen. How did you do? It was probably quite challenging. I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to program out what I showed us during the first video. In VS Code, I have my two images. I have them Airplane PNG and Desert PNG. I also have my main Python file. This is how yours should look getting started. First thing off, we are going to say from Pygame import star. I then can create all my variables here. So I know I'm going to have an FPS and I'm going to say, let's say 30. I'm going to have a width and the width of this can be 700. My height can be 500. You're wondering why are these variables capitalized? Well, it's good practice that a variable that's not going to be changing is capitalized. And these variables are our constant variables. They're never going to change. I then am going to create a plane X position and I will say the plane starting X will be 100, a plane Y and the Y can be 300. And then that plane is gonna need a speed. And I'm gonna say 10. We can change these variables later, but for now I have the variables that I need to begin. 
Let's just get an empty screen up. So I'm gonna go through my game settings and then my loop, and let's just get an empty window up for now. I'm gonna create my object called screen, and this is gonna be equal to display set mode. Remembering that set mode takes two sets of parentheses. Here I can say width and height because we already have those two variables created. Do you guys remember how to give our game a name? I can take my display and I want to say, hey, I want to set the caption. And I will call this Fly Me. Then we will create our game timer. So clock is equal to time clock. That's pretty much our setup complete in order to get a screen to appear, to say the least. Next up, let's just create a game loop here at the end. So I'll say run equals true, and we can say while run. For now, I will only put the first event. And remembering, the first event is our quit event. How did we get that last time? So in the slides, we went something like for every event, in Pygame event get. This time I'm going to do it a little differently. Because I'm importing everything from Pygame, we don't want to say Pygame. Then I have two events. I can just change this to like E, for example. So for every event in event, I want to get them all. Then we'll create our condition and say if the type of event is equal to quit. I can call the quit function and I will now say run equals false, like so. The very last two steps in our application, we want to update our display and then we can take our clock object and call the tick method. This is where we put our variable FPS, so the variable we created at the top. Now, I'm gonna run it and let's aim for a blank screen. There we go. So I have nothing on the screen. I do have fly me and this is gonna be the size of the application. Great, if you have this, this is our starting template. Now we can code the rest of our application. I'm gonna close the window here, trash my terminal, and let's go up now. I'm missing a few things. So at the top of my code, I really want to create like a background object and I want the image to be the desert image. So I can say here transform scale image load and inside here we will put the name of our image. So our image is desert PNG. I will say desert PNG. Our next argument is for the scale method. What size do we want this to be? Well, I want it to be the size of my width and height. So I can pass in those variables. Next up, we will need an airplane. We will do again transform scale. I would like to load an image inside here. Load. And the name of it is airplane.png. For the width and height of this, you can play around with the size that you're looking for. I'm going to say 200 and 100, like so. Great. That's really all we need for the game setup. Everything else for this intro project can really be done here in the loop. Before my events, right when this loop starts, I want to see two things. I want to see the background and I want to see the airplane. I need to paste these on my screen. What method did we learn to paste? Blit. I will say screen.blit. I would like to blit my background at a position of zero, zero, like so. Then I would like to blit my airplane. So I'll say airplane. And the airplane now needs a position, so wherever you want this to appear, we actually made two variables. So plane X and plane Y. 
I want it to appear at those coordinates that we specified when we were creating the variables. Great, we now have our background and we have that airplane. Now we can really go to our events. This is what we're gonna be programming for. Outside that for loop, because I know I'm only going to be using arrow keys, I can actually just create my variables and I can say keys and that can be equal to key.getPressed. So this will be listening for anything we press on the keyboard. If keys, that's that variable, and if we press the left key, let's say, if we press this key and the plane X position is greater than five, I don't want it to leave the screen, so it needs to be greater than five. Then I can say plane X, that current position, I would like to subtract my speed. So what this is saying is it's taking my X position, and if I press the left key, I am subtracting 10 every time this loop runs. Remember that because the 0, 0 coordinate for pi game is the top left, my player should be moving left. I am subtracting from the X position. That's our first event. Let's program the right key. If keys, key right, and, I'd like to do something else, and my plane X is less than. You could say an exact number here. An easy way too is you could say if the X position of the plane is less than the width minus the length of the plane, which is like 200, I think we said. Then I can take my plane X position and I can add the speed to it this time. I'll do the other two. If keys key up is pressed and the plane Y position now is greater than five. Then our plane Y position, we would like to subtract the speed from it. And our final key, you should be getting the idea now, keys, key down, and our plane Y, where's my Y, is uh, less than the height of the screen let's say minus 100. If that's the case, then our plane Y, I can add my speed to it. That's it, that's done. Let's run it and let's watch what happens now. Here we go, here's our application. Fly me, inside we have an airplane. I can go up, I can go left, but I can't really leave the screen. I'm stuck to it. Can't really leave the top. There we go. Amazing. Use this to help you in the future games, okay? Use this as like a template. The basic setup is the same for all the games, and we also programmed a few events in here as well. Brilliant. I'll see you guys in the next lesson which is where we will introduce our first full-fledged Pi Game project. See you guys there. Great guys. In our last video, we introduced Pygame and the concepts needed to create our very own games. We put together a very quick project just for you guys to see how the setup works and how we program our events. In our course, there will be three different projects. Our first project will begin on the easier side, although it's still going to push you to your limits using most of what we have learned. And our final project will use everything we've learned on a much more intense note. Our first Pi game is going to be a retro version of the popular game Ping Pong. And this will be your first fledged game. Let's take a look at the breakdown of what you're going to need to make this game. 
I have not put together any code samples for this. I have broken down the order of what you need to do, and I have also included what each thing will do as well. Using what you know throughout this entire course, using the notes I have linked to the Pi Game lessons, I want you guys to work through and try to create this project in the way that you guys know how. If it takes you a while, that's fine. If you're struggling, that's okay. This should be challenging. Remember, we're using everything we've learned. So don't give up, use your terminal, run your code often to see what's really happening. In your first solo game of ping pong, we will need a few things. You will start off with importing your needed modules. You will create your game settings and any variables that you might need. In this first project, I've decided against classes. We will just use functions to achieve what we're doing. Your game will need you to create four different functions. The first function will be used to draw the paddle on the screen. It will take position. What position do you want the paddle to start at as your parameter? All this function is going to do is it's going to draw two paddles on your screen, player one and player two. You will create a function to draw your ball, and this will also take the starting position of the ball. All this function will do is it's going to draw a white ball onto your screen. Number three, we have our update ball function. This function's job is to keep the ball moving, and it also allows your ball to bounce. Finally, you have the reset ball function. If the ball leaves the screen, this function is called, and it resets the ball to its starting position. Those are the four functions we'll need. After you create your functions, you will create your game loop Inside your game loop, you will have all of your events, and you will have your winning and losing conditions. You can pause the video as you're working through to look through this at what you're trying to do step by step. Very quickly, your game should look something like this. Okay, At the top, we have a score. This is increased every time one player gets a point. We have two paddles, player one and player two. You will program a total of four keys in order to get these paddles moving. And then we have our ball. The ball can bounce off four areas. Your ball can bounce off either paddle, one and two, or it can bounce off the top and bottom of your screen. If the ball leaves the screen on the right or the left, that will reset the ball to its original position. Because our screen is black, a quick hint, you do not need to load in an image. You can actually use what's called the fill method to set your background color. This is in the notes that I have linked to the course. Give it a try, guys. This will be your first game using everything you've learned. In the next video, I will be in VS Code, and I will put this game together how I've done it. I'll see you guys in VS Code. Welcome back to VS Code. What we're doing now is creating our first full-fledged game in Pi Game, and this is a remix of the retro version of Ping Pong. I'd be amazed to see at how many of you guys were able to achieve part of this, or maybe even all of this. If you got through anything on your own, you should feel proud. Really nice job. What I'm going to do is I'm going to code out this game. I might go rather quickly, and I will break things down as they need explaining to, okay? 
So we do not have any images here. Everything we're doing is just done in a main pie file and that's all we really need. We will not use classes, you will use the functions that I described to you during the slides. Let's kick things off. I'm going to go up here and let's do this way. I will do from pygame import start. Brilliant. Um, I would like a width of the screen. I would like a height of the screen. I will then need an actual screen value. I'll need my clock value. Uh, what else do we need here? Well, the game is black and white, so I'll need a black color and a white color. We will have paddles, so I'll need a paddle width. I'll need a paddle height. And I will need a paddle speed. All right, so let's say the height of the game that we're gonna be going for is about 800, or the width, excuse me. The height can be 600. Our screen is going to be display set mode, and the modes we have just created are width and height. Like so, nice. Uh, clock will be our time clock, and let's just give it a name as well, set caption. Uh, I will call this retro pong 84. Cool. Um, black and white, so if you guys read over my Pi Game notes, which you should have, you should know that Pi Game only accepts RGB colors. So black would be zero, zero, zero. That's red of zero, green of zero, blue of zero. White is the polar opposite, and the maximum it can be is 255. So I will be using these colors throughout. Might as well just make these variables now. The width of my paddle, I think a good number would be around 15. The height of the paddle, we could say 100. And the paddle speed, how quickly will it be able to move? I'll say five. Great. So I will set things off now. I have my variables. Let's just go down to a loop and let's just get the screen on the loop. So I'll say run equals true, and we will jump in and say while well, run, there we go. Um, for event in event dot get them all, if the E type, if the event type is equal to quit, then we can quit our game and set it to false like so. Then lastly, we can just say display update and uh, clock dot tick FPS. Do I have, I don't have FPS yet. I'll say 40 for now. Great. Uh, very quickly to let's give that, well, it's already going to be a black screen, right? So I could actually say here for now, screen dot fill. That was my hint. I'm going to say black, put that in there. Let's run it, just make sure we're getting our window. There we are, brilliant. RetroPong84, my template is ready to go. All righty, very nice. All right, I'm gonna come up here. I know my loop's the last thing, so putting a lot of space there. Now, really, the first player needs a position and the second player needs a position. What I'm gonna do here is I'm actually going to hold their positions in a list, which will allow me to use the position later in any loops or any functions by getting the element from that list. So I will actually say player one position, player two position. So my player one position, I'm making a list here. Let's say I would like to give it the values of 50. So my X, he'll be off the left side of the screen by 50. Uh, 
And then his Y, I want to take the height and let's subtract the paddle height and then we can divide that by two. So that'll put him in the middle of the screen, right? I want him to go at the height and divide that by two, but I want to take away the paddle height. On to player position two. Player position two. Their first part, I'd like them to be at the width, minus 50, and then I want to take away the paddle width, too. That'll be kind of like their first real element. And then what we can do here is say the height of my screen minus our paddle height again, and I'll divide that by 2 for their position. Now that I have the first two players, that's great. I'd really like to have the ball starting position, which I could keep in a list, and this will be quite useful later. Let's say the ball pretty much starts in the middle of the screen. So I can say width divided by 2, and then I will say height divided by 2. And that'll do a pretty good job at putting the ball in the middle of our screen. Now that we have the ball's position, the ball needs a speed, and it can't just be one speed. I need an X speed and a Y speed. And because I've made a list of X and Y with two elements, I could make a list for my ball speed as well and say, hey, the X speed's going to be 7 and the Y speed is going to be 7 too. So I've created my two players and the ball speed and position. Very nice. All right, let's jump into a few functions now. So I'll say functions needed for our game. There we are. And we need a function to draw the paddle. We need a function to draw the ball. I can put a space for now, that's fine. We can say update ball because that's really what will need to be done. And then uh, we will have a reset ball as well. Draw a paddle, update ball, reset. I think we're looking good. Our draw paddle. So going into this function, we're not making classes, we're making our functions. Let's create one, call our paddle, and it is gonna take a position. Where do we want the paddle to be drawn? In order to draw, we can say draw.rect. And now rect takes our three arguments. Number one, where do we want to draw this? I want to draw it on my screen, the screen window per se. What color do we want this to be? I want the paddle to be white. And then we need a rect value, an x and y position. So the position is going to be these two, right? Remember how we get an element from a list? Well, I'm going to be giving it a list as the argument, which is passed to our parameter. So pause is kind of like my list. And the x is going to be the first element in my list. And then the y is going to be the second element in my list. Remember that it starts on 0 in Python. So 0 is really the first element, which is the number 50. And then the second element is this equation here. Great. Now that I have those, I'm also going to give it a width and a height because it's a rect value. I have an x, a y. Now it needs a width. And the width of this is quite simple. We have a paddle width, and then we have a paddle height. And that is all we need in order for our paddles to be drawn. Let's do something similar for our ball. So draw ball. Now, this will also take a position, which, broken down, might be our list. But the position of the ball is really just that. Okay? There are a few ways you could do this. Now, I want to draw, but this time, I want to draw a circle. So draw a rect or a circle, the two options. I put that in the notes which we needed as well. So I want to draw my circle where I want to draw it literally on my screen. 
I want it to be white. I need a center. Where do I want the center to be? So I want the center to be the position. So whatever I give this, I want it to just take that as the center, which if we give it the ball position, that would put it at the center of our screen. Now our last one is the radius of the ball, so 10. If you wanted a bigger ball, you could put something like 15. How big do you want this to be, or how easy? Very good. Two functions done. Let's move on to our update ball. So this function's job is to pretty much keep the ball in continuous motion. It's not going to have any parameters. We can call it as we need it. Now, all the variables that I made on the outside, I need them to be accessible here on the inside. Python has a great word called global. If you found a different way to do this, that's fine. Global, I want the ball position to be global. I need the ball speed in order for this function to work. Uh, for now, I'll just keep it as those two. We will be adding as we get scores on the screen. Okay, um, now every time this function is called, our ball is in continuous motion. So I need the ball's x and the ball's y. So let's take our ball position. The x is the first element in our list, and the y is our second element. So continuous motion is I want the ball speed to be 0. Not 0, but it's the first element. So here's our x in the ball position list. And the value of the x speed is the first element in the ball speed list, which is 7. So the x position of the ball will always be moving at a speed of 7. I can set the same thing here for ball speed. So it'll also be going at a speed of 7. Now comes our real conditions. So we need to check for a few things. And I'm going to say if ball position. If the y, if the ball position's y is less than or equal to 10, okay, then something's going to happen here. So if the ball's y is less than 10 or the ball's position y is uh, greater than or equal to the height of our screen minus 10. So this is checking if the ball has touched the top of the screen or the ball has touched the bottom of the screen because it's the Y position. If that's the case, I want to take my Y speed and I would like to say it now equals a negative speed. I want to reverse the speed that it's going in. And all I can do is I can take my ball speed and basically give it a negative value. This is going to allow the ball to bounce. Great. Now we need to check for collisions. So if the ball hits the paddle instead. So let's say if ball position x, if the x position of our ball is less than or equal to our player one position, their x position. So if I translate this, if the ball's x position is less than or equal to player one's x position. And I'm also going to say plus the paddle width because I need to account for that. So that's one element. I'm also going to put and. I have one full expression working together. I'm going to put in the and here because I want to make sure something else is true. I want to say player position one. That's their, what is that? Player position one. That's their y is less than or equal to the ball position y is also less than or equal to, ooh, what could we say here? Player position one their y-axis uh, plus paddle height. There we go. If that's the case, our ball speed should be bouncing 
So I'm going to take my ball x speed equals a minus ball speed for our x. Wow, pretty nice. Okay, we are pretty much going to do the same thing now. So I'm going to check for the positions of the opposite player. Okay, let's check for the opposite one. So let's make an elif in here. And let's say ball position x, remember our list, is greater than or equal to player 2 position x. And the x position of player 2 is less than or equal to the ball's y position. Oops, 1, there we go. And finally, it's less than or equal to, where's my player 2's y position, plus that paddle height again. So remember, I'm trying to break this down as much as I can. Are there more effective ways or efficient? Yeah, absolutely, right? But trying to just translate this and read this in plain English, if you're able to do that, that's a good step in understanding the logic behind these. If that's the case, then I'm going to take my ball speed, the x per se, and I'm going to subtract and give it a negative value for that. All right, there we are. Great. Then we just really need to check for a score. Now, I haven't created a score yet, so I'm actually going to come down here for now, and let's just say player one score is equal to zero, and I'll say player two score is equal to zero. If the ball's position, if that x position is less than or equal to zero, well, that means player two has scored. So I want to increase that by one. Um, if the ball's position, that same x position, is greater than or equal to the width of the screen, that means player one has scored. So I can increase that counter. Mm, okay, great. That brings us to our last function, which will be our reset function. Let's just call it reset. Um, what I need is I will also need my ball's position and speed in order to reset this, like so. And basically what I want to do is anytime this is called, I'm just going to give the ball's speed and position back to it. So I could really just copy these two, and I'm, I'm just going to paste them inside here. When do we want this function to be called? Well, anytime I win or lose, right? So I'm going to say reset, and I'm going to call that within the other function. Great, guys. Okay, um, let me check over our functions. Now, okay, let's just add in the final two. So I need the score because I'm going to be using that in here. Okay, brilliant. We can go down to our game loop now, because that's where most of our action is going to be happening. So let's take away our score. I don't need so much space anymore. Black for now, I'm going to turn off. OK. We have our events. I'm going to start getting creative with my events now. So I'm going to say keys, and that's equal to key.getPressed. We can now really create the keys. So if the keys, oh, not a dictionary. If our keys, uh, KW, so I'm going to start with player one. So the W is going to be acting as the up key. And the player one position, their Y position, is greater than zero. I will allow movement. So I can say player one position is equal to what? What is this going to be equal to? Well, I want it to go basically up. So I can say player one x position, player one y position. I would like to change the y position by the paddle speed, like so. Great. 
Um, also, if the keys, there we go, and our key this time is going to be S. Remember lowercase for that, so S. And the player one Y position is uh, less than the height of the screen. So I can say height, but let's also account for the paddle height. Great, then really what I wanna do is we can just copy this. I can just paste that, and instead of subtracting paddle speed, um, this time I'm just gonna add paddle speed. Okay, coming down, I'm gonna make another if because I am now editing the player two. So if keys, and we are gonna say for the keys, let's say the up key, right? And player two's position, their Y position, is greater than zero. Then we can do a few things here. We can say player two position is now equal to, well, Let's take their original position, so their x. We're not really changing the x position. We're going to be changing the y position. So if we say up, their position we can just subtract the paddle speed from. Take us down to our else if, our keys. So let's program our down key and our y position, there we go, is uh, less than the height minus the paddle height. Again, let's take this, put that inside like so. Brilliant. Okay, so all of our events are activated. Um, if you've tried to run your game, Hopefully there's no error, but if you got one, that's okay, because nothing's going to be happening in your game. We need to start calling the functions that we've made. The first function, I want my ball to start moving, so I'm going to call update ball. Um, and update ball, we could say, let's get that background color back of black. There we go. Now that we have our ball in motion and the background of black, we can apply a few more things here. We would like to draw the paddle. Now, I'm gonna take this because I want it two times. There are two paddles, per se. The first paddle is gonna be at player position one. Where am I at here? There we go. And the next paddle will be drawn at player two position. Our last one was going to be draw ball, and that can be drawn at the ball's position. Wow, so much has happened. We're pretty close. Let's. I'm going to run this. Okay, so I'm getting an error up here. Right, my ball is not moving. Something's happening. Let's go and investigate what is happening. Um, okay, so that was most likely coming from our update method. Ah, uh, here we go. Okay. I need to add the speed to the ball. I was just saying equals. That's not going to do it anything. Ah, there we go. So it's resetting. And I can move... Oh, my arrow keys. I need to fix the arrow keys. So I can't go down on the right arrow key. So let's go over here. If down, then I want to add, not subtract. Let's give that a try again, just a quick test. There we go, down. Let's try and see if it bounces, no bouncing. Okay, so it is down on both keys. Great, let's investigate the bouncing. So that's going to be coming from our update function. All right, let's uh, let's check in here because really that's what's most likely occurring. Elf, if the balls are in position. Uh, oh, here we are. Here we are. And uh, player two position. Their y. I need their y is less than the ball's position y, which is less than player's position y 
plus paddle height. Okay, let me run it. Yes, 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 yeah, there we go. Okay, now we're going. Brilliant, okay. The final touches, the final, final touches. What I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna go, let's just go here. I need a font in my game, okay? So I need text. So I'm gonna say font. And well, actually let me be more specific, score font. This is going to be equal to font.font. .font. And the values here, Pygame font, I'll just say none. And I will say 45. Before I do this too, I'm gonna to say font.init. I need to activate the font. Now we have font in our game and I can use it as score font in order to basically render out text onto the screen, which I'm gonna do down in my loop. Uh, this would be perfect for it. Okay, so in our loop, I can now create one like player one score. Uh, nope, player one text. Let's say player one text. And this is gonna be equal to our score font. I want to render the font on my screen. I want to render the score, but remember the score is a counter, so I need to take a string function. And I can say player one score. That's what I want to render on the screen. I'm going to say true. You could say false here. It just curves your text a little bit. It's very difficult to see. And I'm going to say white as the color of that. Great. Copy that. Let's paste that down here. I will create player two, and I want to render player twos onto the screen. Now that we have our text objects, let's say screen blit. I'd like to blit. I would like to blit my player one text. Player one text I can put at the coordinates, oh my, let's say the width divided by four. That'll be the X and the Y, let's just give it a buffer zone of 20. Okay, coming down, I'm gonna say player uh, two, let's say width, uh, whoops, I need to get off. So I'll say uh, width, let's multiply the width by three divided by four. I think that makes sense. Let me run it to see if we have anything. Yeah, okay, okay. And you can see the counters are actually working now as well. We have real live scores. Oh, this is so great. And the last thing I think we'll do is I just want a losing condition. I don't want that to go forever. So I'll say if player one score is greater than or equal to five or player two score is greater than or equal to five. So if you get five points, you'll win. All we can do for that is just say run equals false. And that would officially end your game. Let me run it, let me lose on purpose so we can actually see here. So one, two, three. And ideally our game should immediately cut out. Like so, very nice. If you followed along, Go back through this code, read line by line, and in your code, guys, put notes, like what does this do, okay? Put notes, read through, break it down so you understand what's really happening. Very well done on your first official project. I will see you guys in the next video for our second game. Congratulations, guys. You've completed your first game in Python. That was our previous game, the ping pong game. We are now going to take it a step up a notch, and we are going to create a remix of the popular Flappy Bird. I have called my game Flappy Minor, and you will see why soon. 
This game will use classes as well, which will need us to use everything we have learned in our course. Let's take a look at how this game will work. You can see on the left, I have put an actual output of the game that we will see upon completion. My player is actually a pixelated miner, right? Like a miner in a coal mine or a gold mine. In the game, we also have a score as well as a set of pipes. When the space bar is pressed, our miner jumps. Else, if we're not pressing the space bar, he will be falling. Every pipe that passes is going to be at a random position. So think about that. Random position. What do we need in this game to achieve that? Every time we go through a pipe and the pipe leaves the screen, our score is going to increase as well. Our real and only game condition is going to be if we touch a pipe, our game ends. You could also program that if you get 20 points, you also win. How can you do that? Well, that is another condition you can put in your game loop. While you're thinking about this game, I really want you to think about how can we use lists in this game. You saw me using lists in the last game. If you did too, great. If you found another way, that's okay too. As I've said, there's many ways to achieve the same goal in Python. But specifically think with this game, how could you use lists to achieve something we need to do? Let's take a look at how our classes will be structured in this game. Our first class will be our super class. Our super class is going to have our constructor, which is your init function. Init is going to have five properties. I need a property for speed, an image property, which will allow us to load an image. I will need a rect property. So if you're unfamiliar with rect, it is slightly a new topic and sometimes it is hard to wrap your head around. Do a little research on this. Everything in Pygame is a rectangle. If it's a circle, if it's an image, it doesn't matter. It has a rectangle position. It's basically an invisible hitbox behind your image that's going to check where that image is at on your screen. In order to create one from an image that we load into the game, we can use the method getRect. We will also create two properties for the X and the Y position of these rect objects. The only method that you need to create outside of your constructor function will be an update method. When this method is called, it's going to be responsible for pasting all the game images onto our screen. Remember to use the blit method to do that. The only parameters that we need for you to pass into init are going to be an image, an X, a Y, and a speed parameter. These four can be used to build the properties that you need in your super class. Moving on to our player class. In the bird class, so this class is for our player. You could call it player or bird. It's your game. It's your classes. But what we need in order to get our player to work correctly I am going to create a constructor method in my child class, which will inherit everything from the super class, but I will also create a new property for angle. And what this is going to do is, if our player is jumping, I want my player to jump at a slight angle. If the player is falling, he should also fall at an angle. This will make our game look a bit more flush, a bit more cleaner by adding in an angle. 
In this class, we'll have a controls method, and here is where you will add all the events for your player. We will also have an update method. The update method is going to be responsible for rotating the player's image. Now this is based on their vertical velocity. So if you're going up, the rotation of your player should be looking up, like an airplane taking off or a bird flying up. If the bird is falling, it should be angled down. So one new property and two methods in your bird class. Finally, this brings us to our pipe class. This is going to be responsible for putting a set or pair of pipes on the screen. Now, important note, this is actually not going to inherit anything from your super class, okay? But we will create its own constructor function. And we need five properties for this class to work correctly. A speed at which your pipes will be moving, a width for how wide each pipe will be, the height of your pipes. Now these are going to be a random height. I will need the rect of the top pipe and I will need the rect of the bottom pipe. And this is going to allow us to track their position on the screen. You can use the rect class which takes an X and Y position and also a width and height. We will create one for the top pipe and the bottom pipe. For rect, refer to the notes attached to the Pi Game lesson. We will have another update method for this class and it will be used to keep two pipes in motion, allowing them to move across your screen. We will create a method called draw and this will be used to draw the white pipes onto your screen. Hint, hint for Pi Game, draw rect. And we can draw a rectangle onto the screen. Lastly, we will create a special reset method. And this will be used to reset the pipes to a new position once they leave your screen. These three will work together to do a few things. One, keep the pipes in motion. Two, reset the pipes. And three, they are going to be giving your pipes a random height, which makes our game like Flappy Bird. Amazing. I have gone through the three classes we need in order to build out this game. Remember, we had our pipe class, we have our bird class, and we have our super class. The goal you're aiming for is a game that looks like this and that works very similar to Flappy Bird. Try using everything you've learned and see how far you can get before you watch my next video. I will see you guys in VS Code where I'll be putting together our game of Flappy Miner. See you there. Good luck. Hi guys, I hope you're getting immense value from this course I've put together for you. Just a reminder, remember, I'm not getting paid anything for this entire course. So to help me out, you guys can head over to the platform that I'm paying to host for you and utilize it, engage, get higher quality content from me, and get all those guides. It's still free, absolutely free. It's the first link in the description, right? Head on down there. That really helps me as I release more of these courses to help you guys go from A to Z in Python. And I mean, if you really don't want a course, that's fine, okay? It's still free, I don't know why you wouldn't, but if you don't, okay. The first link in the description, I'm gonna give you guys that handcrafted Python guide that I made because that guide I made for this course. You're not getting the most of the course if you're not using the guide, it pairs perfectly. That's also the link in the description. You don't need to go to the platform, just head there and get the guide. All right, I hope you're enjoying this content. If you are, please do me a favor, click the like button and subscribe as I have weekly content out dedicated to helping you grow. All right, back to our lesson.
Welcome back to VS Code. We are now on our second project, which is Flappy Bird or Flappy Miner. I'm interested to see how you guys got on so far in this game. As you can see, I have a completely blank screen. All I have in my files tab are my two images that we're going to use. I'm going to create my game file, main pie, and we are going to jump right into it. First thing off the bat, let's import from Pygame, import star. And my pipes are gonna be at a random position. So I'm actually going to need a randant from the random module. I will say import, we can import randant like so. Let's create some classes. So we know that we need a super class. We will need like a player style class we will need a pipe class. Those are gonna be really our three classes that we're gonna use here. In our super class, call it what you wish, I will say class main, and we will create our constructor. We have self, we have a file, an image, an X, a Y, and a speed. Creating those properties, so for speed, our image is gonna be transform scale. Like this is just like a picture, right? Image dot load. Uh, inside load, what are you trying to load? We're trying to load that file parameter. And the size is gonna be 50 by 50. I need to have a rect for this object. So the object that I want to get rect is the image. I give it a picture. I want to get the rect object of that picture. So I can just say get rect. We can create one for our rect x position. And the value is our x parameter and our y position. The value is the y parameter. Great. That's what we need for init. The only other method in this superclass is going to be our update method. Update does not require anything given to it. We are just going to use this to paste images on the screen. What image do we want on the screen? Well, the answer is we don't know yet, but we do have a property called self image. Whatever value that has, whatever picture, I want that to go on the screen. And I want it to go on the screen at the X and the Y position. So I can take our properties, rect X and self.rect.y as the X and Y position. Now I'm getting this, it will be an error if we run it. I haven't created a screen yet. So if you wanted to bypass this really quickly, you could create your screen down here real quick, set mode. And for now, I'll just say 200, 200. That's not gonna be the screen, but that took care of that initial error. Brilliant. So our super class is done. That's all we really need for that. We need a player class. So call this, I don't know, minor, I suppose. And minor is gonna inherit the super class main. Now in minor, it is gonna inherit everything that came with the super class, but we also have one new property of its own. So I'll create our constructor again, and we're gonna give it everything that uh, our super class had. Then we can say super dot init, like so. And inside there, just like before, we'll say file x, y, speed. And then now all of our parameters in the minor class are being used because it's inheriting from the super class. Our new property is going to be our angle. And the angle will be the initial angle of our player, our bird, the minor, whatever you want to call it. That's it. So we inherit everything, I created one new property. Now we will have an update method in this class as well. And what update's gonna do is it's gonna rotate the bird's image and that's based on the vertical velocity. So if the bird is going up or down, 
I want to slightly rotate the image of our player. So I'll create a variable, rotated image, let's say, and that's going to be equal to transform. This time, instead of scale, I've already scaled the image. I want to rotate. What do we want to scale? I want to scale the image property. And then I'm also going to give it the angle because it takes two. So I can give it that new property we just made, angle. This update method is going to blit to our screen our rotated image. And it's going to blit it at the X position again and the Y position that we initially stated. Our angle, every time this is called, I want to increase my angle by the speed. So I can take my speed. And that way it's going to give it a bit more of a look to our player. It's actually going to move as we're, as we're playing the game. And then I can update the angle value. So the angle plus the speed. Then I'm going to take the angle. And I'm going to say, well, I want to limit the maximum angle. So I don't want it to spin or go crazy. I just want to have, I want to set the maximum. So I'm actually going to use the min function here. Now min is a Python function. I've added this in the notes for Pygame. And I'm going to say zero, and I'm going to say self.angle as the other argument for that. Mm, great, looking good, looking really good actually. Okay, so our update method's done, that allows it to update. Then we wanted a controls method. Now controls, instead of putting the events for the player in the game loop, I'm actually going to store them right here. And we can create our variable keys, and that's equal to key get pressed, right? And all we really need to say is if our keys, what key do you want to use for this? Well, I'll say the space key I want to use. And the Y position of our object is greater than zero. I don't want the player to go above the top of the screen. If that's the case, then I can take the current Y position of the image and I want to subtract self.speed, let's say times two. So he jumps a little faster like that. And then I would like to give it the angle of uh, let's say 15 degrees. That'll be an angle applied to it. Else, if we're not pressing space, I need him to be falling. So I need the rect position and I'm going to add self.speed, right? Remember if we're adding, we're actually going down the Y axis because Pi game starts in the top left of our screen. And I'm going to take my angle property and I'm going to say the min, and we're going to say negative 15 here and we can say self.angle and let's add our speed to the angle as well, like so. It'll give it a nicer look. Um, all right, our two methods there are done. That brings us to our pipe class. So I'll create a class called pipe, and pipe is really not gonna take anything, so I don't actually need that. It's gonna have its own constructor, and inside here, I need a few values for it. So we really need an X position, a Y position, and a speed for each pipe, like so. So going through, these will be given when we create an object of the pipe class. I have a speed. I do want a width of the pipe, but I don't need to give that as a parameter. I can just say, hey, each pipe is going to have a width of 65. Now I can use that just like a variable anywhere in my class. Every pipe has a width, every pipe also has a height. Here, each pipe is going to have a random height. It's gonna be anywhere from 100 to let's say 300. I can change that if it's too small or too big here later. All right, what other properties do we need? I need a 
I'm just gonna put it here for now. I need a a rect for the top object. I need a rect for the bottom object. Okay, so for my top rect, I'm gonna use the rect class, like that. And it takes an x and y, which are my parameters we gave the class. And the width can be, this is the top one, so self.width, that won't really change, and then self.height. And that can apply for the top one. Now for the bottom object, I can also create a rect, and I can say my x position is the same. The y is going to be y, but I'm going to add the height property that we made to it, and then we'll actually add additional like padding, additional space almost. Then our width will be our self.width, because I want all the pipes to have the same width, and then the height of the bottom pipe is going to be the height of the screen, haven't made that yet, minus the property self.height, and let's take a little bit extra away, 100. To sort that out, let's say width is equal to a number and height is equal to a number. So for Flappy Bird, we kind of want a taller height, I'll say 600, and the width can be 450. That'll be good for our game. That'll be really good. Okay, great. So in its complete, I'm going to create an update method for this pipe class. So what I want to do, ideally, is I want to take the top rect's x position. So every time I call this method, it's constantly going to be moving based on the speed we give the object when we create it. So the x is going to keep moving. The same thing for the bottom. It's going to keep moving. So I can give speed to that as well. Great. Update's done. We can then draw two pipes. So I'll just call this draw pipe. And draw pipe, to do it, we need to call draw two times. We want to draw a rectangle. Where do we want to draw this? I want to draw it on my screen. I want it to be white. I don't have a color white yet. You can choose a different color, but I need a color. Then what object are we actually drawing? Well, I'm drawing the top rect, like so. I can copy this because it's going to be the same values. The only value that I'm going to change is a uh, bottom rect. I want to draw the bottom one as well. Let's jump in here to sort that out and say white is equal to our RGB. There we go, so it clears up the white. Whew, almost there. So we've done two methods. That brings us to our last method. We want to reset the pipes. So basically, I want them to go back to the right side of the screen once they leave the left screen. So to do this, we actually already did this. I can pretty much just take these three properties we initially made, and I'm going to put them there. We're just going to reuse those again. Now, I'm going to change a few things. So instead of X and Y, I'm going to say the X is going to start at the width of my screen, and for the top rect, the Y is going to be zero. The bottom rectangle is also going to be at the width of our screen, but the Y position I'm going to change slightly. So let's say, let's just say Y is self height plus 200. That'll give it a good resetting point. We've completed our classes. Now I'm kind of down here to where I have my variables. I want a variable for score because I'm going to keep track of the score. And then I'll need a font as well, so like a score font. And this is going to be equal to font.font. .font. I will say none again. And I will say, let's say font 45. Remember, if we're using font, we need to initialize the font before we use it. So I'll say font in it. Now, very quickly, now that I have a score, where in the pipe class would we change this score? Well, that's going to be done in our update method. 
I actually want to use the score variable here. So I'll say global score. And I'll make an actual condition here. I'll say if the self top dot x, they're moving together, I don't need to say both pipes. I'm really just checking if the top rex pipe has left the screen. And I'm actually just going to say like the right position of it is less than zero. If that's the case, that means it's left the screen. So I can say score plus equals one, increase our counter, and then I would like to call the reset function we made. That is gonna be calling this function down here. So if one pipe leaves the screen, I'm putting new pipes on the other side of my screen. Great, okay. So after our screen, what are some other initial game setup steps we could have? Well, how about we give your game a name? So let's say display update, not display update, what am I saying here? Let's say uh, set caption. I'm gonna call this Flappy Miner 2.0, uh, 2.0, that's a good name. We'll create a clock, time clock, like so, brilliant. I'll put a comment there. Let's get our background image actually into our game at this point. Remembering how we do that, we can say transform scale image load. What image do you want to load? I want to load the background. Is it a JPEG or a PNG? JPEG. Like so. Um, it is going to be the width and the height of my screen. Then before I continue coding, let's create a quick loop. Let's just say while true. So run equals true, while run. Let's uh, put here a few things. So remembering the first thing I really wanna do here is our um, event. So for event in event.get, we can say if the event type is equal to quit, then we will quit the game. Run now becomes false. Great, then let's say screen.blit. What do we wanna blit on the screen? Well, my background, and I would like my background to go at zero, zero. That brings us to our final two lines of our code. Let's update our display, and then just say clock.tick40 for our FPS. I'm gonna give it a run and just see where we're at. Okay, so haha, <laughs> I didn't change the width and height. It's incredibly small. Uh, let me let me change that. So let's change. I just did that to get rid of the errors. Okay, so I run it now. Now we have our actual game screen. Okay, great. This is what I want to see. Nothing's on it yet, but we're on the right path. All righty. Going back out of my loop now, I'm gonna make a few things here. I need an object for my player. So minor, that's my player, is equal to the minor class. Inside here, I need to give it a file name. So my minor PNG, I need to give him an X, a Y, and a speed. Let's say a speed of 10. I'll also create an object for my pipes. Now, this is interesting. I'm gonna have two pipes on my screen. I don't wanna make two different objects. It'll make it more difficult to actually go through the objects. So I'm gonna make a list and I'm gonna append my class to the list as an element. What I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna give it a width variable. And what this is doing is it determines the starting X position of the pipes. And I can say here, I can add I times, ooh, let's say 200. So this is gonna add a gap between our two pipes. And it's really gonna have like a 200 gap between each pipe. 
Great, I'm gonna say zero, right? That's our starting place for the first pipe at the top of the screen. And then our last one I'm gonna give it is a, a five. Okay, like that's gonna be the pipe speed. So the X position is the width, and this multiplying by 200 is going to give a gap between the two pipes, but this object is just for the first pipe. So the first pipe will start at zero, once it draws the first pipe, it'll give it a gap. And then the pipe will be going at a speed of five. How many pipes do I want? Well, I want two. So I need to actually tell it in my list, and I can say for i. Now I have the i. In range, let's say two times. It's gonna make me two pipes. That's what's happening here. We have our two objects, minor and pipes. This is really all we need to get everything functioning. In our loop, we can now apply some of the logic to our loop. We have our background. Let's say minor.update. Let's update our minor. Uh, let's say minor.controls. Let's call that method. Remember, a method needs to be linked to those objects. And let's draw our pipes. Because our pipes are in a list, I can use a for loop. I can say for every pipe in my list pipes, I want to call the update method for every pipe. That'll get them kind of going there. If I run it, let's see if we're error free or what's really happening here. Well, you saw my guy, okay. My guy's moving. No pipes are there yet. Okay. So for uh, pipe and pipes. Actually, let me try and do this backwards. It's not really backwards. Let's just say I want to update the pipe, but I also want to draw the pipe. I'm going to give that a run to see if it's going to function how we want it to function. Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, they are changing. Great. Cool, very cool. Okay, I'm just gonna keep it like that then. So for every pipe, we're updating and we're drawing the pipe. Okay, I'm also gonna put like a condition here because I wanna check for every pipe. So I'm gonna say if the miner's wrecked, if, if the miner collides with. So in the notes I created, collide wrecked is a special Pi game method which checks if two objects, two images collide in the game. So if the miner collides with, let's say, pipe.toprect or miner.rect.collide rect with uh, pipe.bottomrect, like so. Cool. If that's the case, just if you want to print off something you could, you could just print off game over and run equals false. Wow. I think our game actually works exactly how we want it. I don't have a score yet. I touched it, yeah, it broke, okay. And you can see it's actually turning angles too. Yeah, so it's going up, okay. <laughs> I'm not that good at it. Okay, great. Let's do a little bit more. So let's kind of create a condition. Um, our pipes are updating. They're just kind of a bit strange. So to kind of prevent that from happening, I'm going to take the first element from my pipes list, which is actually just one object, and I'm going to say top rect. I want the right position of it. When that leaves my screen, just like we did before, I can actually take it off of my list. So I want to pop. I want to pop the first element. Um, pop is a method which allows us to pop off an element from the list. We have learned other ways to do it. There are other ways to take an element from a list. This is just a simpler method. Um, from that way, I can now say pipes. I want to append. Remember append, we have used that. A new pipe object. This object is gonna have a width, that's good. Uh, 
well, not a, that'll be my x position, the width, right? My y is going to be 0, the speed is 5. And then we can here increase our score by 1. A pipe leaves the screen, that means we got past it. I can increase the score. Um, I'm going to say one more condition. If my bird, my miner, he can't go above the top, but if he falls below the bottom, he's actually going to lose two. So if the miner's y position is greater than the height of the screen, run is also equal to false. Great. Um, looking good. Let's take care of the final details. That would be our score. So our score text, I need that on the board. And I created score font and we can render. I wanna render score plus, I can use plus because these are the same types of data. It'll have score and then an actual score. Uh, we'll say true and then we will say, I have white, right? Yeah, white. I can use that. Screen blit. Let's blit our score text. There we go. Um, our score text we can put at the top left of the screen, 1010. Great. Let's give it a run. Okay, let me lower my FPS to like 30. If it's too high sometimes, right, it's, it's not gonna do a better job. Sometimes we're better off going to a lower FPS. There we go, my scores, they are going up. Okay, so I got a score of three. All right, amazing guys. We just smashed through another game. This one was significantly more difficult. If there's anything else you want to add, spend some time improving this game, right? What else could we do to make it better? Try and do something like that. Try and get, if you lose, try and get your game to stop and try and get it to say you lose on the screen. That would be really great for us. Well done. As always, spend time, review what we just did. I ask, all I ask is that you spend 10 or 15 minutes, read through the code that you just created, break down what's really happening. We are gonna go into our last and final project of this course, and this will be the most intense project we've done so far. I will see you guys in the next video when you're ready. This is it, everyone. You have done it. Welcome to the final project of our course. In this project, we're going to be creating what I call the Bitcoin maze, collecting coins, avoiding ghosts, all to find that Bitcoin wallet. Let's jump in and take a peek. So I'm going to actually put me in a weird position. I'm going to put me right there in the middle. Uh, okay, just so we can see all that text. On the left, this is going to be our game once it's complete. And in the game, you can see we have a miner again, because Bitcoin mining, you get it? We have these coins that will be placed in random positions. And we need to get this Bitcoin wallet here at the end. We also have an enemy, a ghost, which is going to be moving throughout our game. For this to work, we can use the arrow keys to navigate through the maze. If the miner touches a wall, they reset. They go back to their original position. The goal is we want to collect the coins, which will increase our wallet size. And these coins are placed randomly throughout our game. If the player touches the ghost, you go back to the starting position also, and our ghost is always in motion. It's always moving. In order to win, you must collect all the coins on the screen and the Bitcoin wallet 
and then that is how our game ends and we win. So a lot of things are happening here and it looks pretty cool. Let's jump into our class breakdown. So here we are in our super class. Um, quick note, so we haven't introduced this yet. Our super class is actually going to inherit a very special Python class and it's called sprite.sprite. .sprite. We want to put this in our super class. And this sprite class is meant to be used as a base class for our game objects if we're working with a game. Our super class within its constructor method, we are going to create five properties. Our speed property as well as the image property. We can create a rect property just like we did in the last project based off the image property. And we also want to get an X and Y position. So our four parameters for this class will be image, X, Y, and speed. This class will only have one method as well. Just like before, we'll have our update method, which we can use the blit method in order to get our images onto the screen. Our second class, I can actually put me back now, this will be our player class. We do not need a constructor because we will inherit everything from the super class. Remember how to do that? And the only method we will have in here is our controls method, very similar to our last project. And we can add all of our events in this method. You guys can use the arrow keys or the AWSD keys. But remember, your player cannot leave the screen. That's all we need for this child class, our player class. It'll inherit our super class. We also need a class for our ghost, the bad guy in the game, our ghost class. There will be no constructor method because we do inherit from the super class again. In the ghost class, we create an update method. When this is called, this is going to keep the ghost in motion. So if the ghost's X position is less than 250, we want to change direction. If the ghost's X position is equal to the width, the edge of our screen, we also want to change directions. And what we can do when this happens is we can apply the property speed to the ghost in a condition. This will keep the ghost in continuous motion. If it gets to the width of the screen, it changes directions and it goes back in the other direction that same speed, right? We will create a coin class for all of the coins we saw on the screen. Now our constructor method, we will be building in this class, but the coin class itself will inherit the sprite.sprite .sprite class that comes from Pygame, just like our super class does. The two new properties that we need for this class is we will need a rect property, so x, y, width, and height, that goes inside our rect class, just like the last project, and we will also need an image property as well. The only method that coin class will be using is draw coin. So we want to blit all the coins onto our screen using this method. When your player touches a coin, you want the coin to disappear, to go away. We have a quick new method with Pygame, and it's actually called kill. What the kill method does is it destroys an object. So if your player touches a coin and we were to say coin.kill, that coin would leave the screen. And that's going to help make our game even better. So try and use that in your game too. This brings us to our final class. And this is going to be our border class. This will be used to actually draw each of the walls in our maze independently so we can design them how we want to. This will be similar to some of our previous classes. Yes, we will have our constructor method, 
but we will still be inheriting sprite.sprite .sprite as the class. We will create five properties that we need in order to draw the walls. We need a property for color, an X and a Y property to justify the position of the wall, and we also need a width and a height property. This will help us design the wall's length and its width. The only real method this class has is the build wall method, which just like the update methods, it's going to blit or paste our walls on the screen when we use this method. Okay, so keep in mind this class will inherit sprite.sprite .sprite, and it will have five new properties of its own as well. One more exciting thing we're gonna do in this final project. We are gonna be adding sound into this game as well. In this game, we are gonna have background music. We will have music for collecting the coins, music if you die, and music if you win. Or I should say, all of these will be sounds, but we will have a starting background music. Just like if we initialize our font, when it comes to sounds, we can say mixer in it. Mixer is what we use in Pygame. It allows us to use these sounds. Right after we initialize the mixer, if we want to have background music, we can use this code, mixer music load, and then we will insert the file name of the music. In order for that music to play, all we need to say is music mixer play. These three lines are used to generate continuously playing background music. But let's say you want to have a sound for when you collect a coin, and it's only triggered when your player collects that coin. Well, we can create a sound, so like a variable, so money, and it's equal to mixer.sound. Anytime I want this money variable, this money sound to play, I just need to say money.play whenever I want it to. It'll play that sound one time. Pretty cool. We've learned about fonts. We are now including sounds and music in our final project. Guys, I am going to let you get started on this. Use the first two projects we've done. Keep them open on the side to help you through this one. This one will be challenging. There might be some tedious parts as well. Once you get your wall class built, you're going to have to adjust each wall to put it where you want it to. Also use the notes. Consider this as like a final project. See how much of this you can do. It should be challenging, but it should be a good time. I'll see you guys in our final VS Code video where I will put this project together too. All right, wonderful. Here we are for our final project. We've made it this far. Now, I'm going to code out this project here, and I'm going to do it in a slightly different manner, but I'm going to still include everything we've learned in this entire course, including creating your own modules that we can link to our final application. I'm inside my main Pi file, and I have also brought in everything that I have included in the starter pack. We have our sounds and music, as well as all of our images. Very good. So in my main file, I'm gonna start off and I'm just gonna get everything set up so we can get to the juicy stuff. Let's import Pygame. Um, for the coins, I did say that they're going to be at a random location, so I'm going to bring in from random import. I can just import everything. We will only be using randint, though. 
And then I'm gonna create all my variables I want. So I want a wall color. I would like to have black, white. I always put black and white because you never know when you're gonna need them. Uh, if I lose, I'm gonna use red, actually. And let's get these colors in here. So let's say black, remembering our RGB, 255. Your wall color, you can put absolutely anything you want. So be creative. If you guys Google and just get on Google and type in RGB calc, click the first link. It's probably Web3 Schools. And you can play around and actually find the color you want to use. The color I'm going to be using is 56. 8263. And then a standard red, right? So I'll say 250, 15, 15. That won't be the maximum, but it's going to be a pretty bright Ferrari type of red. Let's see. My last variable that I'm going to put here is going to be a coin counter. So I will increase this as I collect coins throughout my game. Uh, for now, those are all the variables that I will be using. Um, we will be using a font in our game, so I'm going to initialize my font and I'm going to create like a starting font. So I'm just going to say font equals font dot font, which I can use a few different times here. I will say none. If you want to put in something, you can also do that too. Uh, in order to put in your own font, you will need to use system font. You can read up on how that can be done as well. Now, for my font size, I'll just say 45. That's been working quite well for us. I'm going to have a few things. I'm going to have a win text, a lose text, a coin text, and like a coin counter text. All of these I will render on the screen at one point or another. Now, for my win text, I'll take my font object I just created, and I'm going to render what do we want the text to say? I want it to say you win, like so. Remembering that we will put true here and then a color. So uh, an actual color, let's actually create green because if you win, that's usually a good thing. So red will say 15, green to 50, and blue will say 15. I will pop green inside there. If we lose, I would like to render out you, let's make it caps, lose. We'll say true, and we will say red. That was the color I produced earlier. Coin text in our coin counter, these are going to be white. I could store these in one together, like the past game, but as extra practice, I've put in two objects this time. So I will render out the coin text. All this is going to say is like coins. We'll say true. And then I want to use not while. I want to use white. Very nice. And our last one we can render out on the screen. Here I actually want my coin counter value. So I need to convert that to a string. And not. I just want my coin counter true, and finally white. There we are. Great. The new topic that I introduced for this project was actually music, how we get music in this game. So in this next part, I am going to include my music. So I need to activate the mixer, which allows us to use sound in Python. I would like to have a background music, so in order to get this, we can say mixer music load. And if we check our files, I would like to have actually cave mp3 as my background music. So I'll put in cave mp3 here, like so. There we go. In order to get that to run, we can say mixer music play. And that will get our music up and playing. Now, although we have a background music, I have other sounds here. So a coin sound, if I win or if I lose. I want to create a variable for all of those, which I can call at a later stage in my game. So I will have a coin sound. I will have, let's say, win. I can't say win again. So win sound and lose sound. 
like so. In order to get these values in here, I can just say mixer, use their sound class, and inside here, this will be the coin drop MP3. I can save that. I will put in a mixer sound again for our win, and this is actually called win wave. So very quickly, right, in Pygame, the file extensions for sound, I could use MP3, I could use .ogg, or I could use .wave. Any of those would work in a game like this. So as you have noticed, most of ours are MP3, or we have wave in there as well. Mixer, sound, and our final one is the lose.wave. There we go. So I have my three sounds in there. That's great. Now, although if you click play, we don't have our game loop. So we're not going to see anything or hear anything for that matter. Let's create our initial game settings. So we always have our width. We always have our height. I'm going to throw an FPS in there. And let's call the width of our game. I'm going to put that at 700. I'm going to put the height at 500. My FPS, I want it to update cleanly. So I'm going to start at 40. If I decide to increase that later, I can do so right here in this line. Now that we have those, we can move on to creating our screen object. So we will create our screen with our set mode and inside here we will put our width and our height that we stated. I would like to have a title for this game so our set caption and let's call this ooh, I don't know Bitcoin miner course like so there we go. Uh, let's create our clock so time dot clock and then lastly, I'm just going to create my background object. So this will be an image that we have already going for us. And we can get that in by scaling the image and then loading the image. Our image is called background JPEG. That is what we want to be loading as our image. So in here I will state background JPEG. And then I would like to scale this to match the width and height of my screen. So I can put in my variables like so. Um, brilliant. So we have all the variables we really need here at the top. Um, all the constant variables, my fonts with our objects, our sounds, and then our game settings, which is great. At this stage, I will actually go to the bottom and I'm gonna create our loop. So let's do this two ways. I'll say run equals true. And then let's say while run as we have, and we will create our initial event. So for every event in event, I want to get them all. If the event type is equal to a quit event, I would like to quit and I would like to set run to now equal false, like so. Now, when you die, I don't want the game to actually close. I want the window to stay open. So in order to do this, the easiest way is I could create another variable on the outside here, and I could say end. And let's say end is initially set to false. The game hasn't ended yet. So inside here, I'm actually gonna say if end is not equal to true, then our game hasn't ended. It should stay on the screen. And what this is going to allow us to do is it's going to allow us to reset the game if your player dies. If we don't have something like this in the game, our window will just close once we die. We don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna say if end is equal to true. On my screen, I'm gonna blit or paste a few things I should say. The first thing is going to be my background, starting at our 0, 0. Um, I can then put in the score, well, technically our coin. So I'm going to say coin counter text. And the position of the coin counter, I want this to be on the right side of the screen. 
So what I can do for this is I want it to be at my width as my x, and I'm going to subtract some space because the text will take up some room, and then I'm going to at my y of 35. Uh, for our other one, I would like to basically blit on here. We have uh, oh, coin text and coin counter text. So let's say the first one is going to be our coin text. Then we can blit down here our coin counter text. That's going to come out a bit better. Uh, this will be to the right side of the coin text. So I can say width minus 50 this time. And it's going to have the same Y. Great. So we've blitted our first three starting points to the screen. Now, the last stage I'll do here is I will just update my display. And we will say clock.tick. This time I can say FPS because we have our variable. Let's give this a whirl and see what our output is going to be currently. Brilliant. So you should be hearing some background music and you should see a screen like this with our coins counter. Amazing. I'm going to close that for now. Um, alrighty. So here's our initial setup. It's all come together really well. Now what I'm going to do is I don't have any classes yet. And I actually want to be making these classes. But I want to do it through a module. So using what we learned, I'll create a module called classes.py. And inside here, I will be putting all four classes we need for our game to function. In this module, I also am going to be needing to import Pygame because key elements will be using it. And then the only other three variables that we'll need again is you can actually copy this from our main file. I will need width, height, and screen. FPS, we don't actually need that here. But in order for our classes to use key elements, we will need these three as well. Great. So our super class, main, we are inheriting the sprite class from Pygame. So I'm going to put it in there. And then I can use main and other classes as well. It'll also inherit this sprite class, which we use when we work with objects or players. Inside here, we will have our constructor. Now, self needs a few things. We need an image. I'll say IMG. I need a player X, a player Y, and then a speed. For each of these, we will be creating properties. But I want to inherit everything from that sprite class. So we can use super. And we will say in it like so. And that's all we need. Then we'll go through. And I will start with my image. So my image is going to be equal to the image that we pass into this class. And we can load this image just like we load any other image. The image we want to load is actually the image parameter that we gave. In these players, I want them to have a width and height of 50. We will create a speed property. And of our image class, I actually want to be getting um, the rect values. So I'll create a rect property. And I want to get the rect from the current property we made called self.image. So get rec. That's all we have to do for that. Now, in order to obtain the X and Y position of this rect or this image, we can create a property called rect X, and that will be equal to our player's X position. And we can say rect Y, and that will be equal to our player's Y position, like so. Our final method... Well, it's really just one method. Uh, what this is going to be doing is it's going to trigger when the game ends. So I could say, like, game end here. 
And really all it's doing is it's going to blit images to our screen. What image do we want? Well, I want my self.image, which we created up inside in it. And the position of these will be the X coordinate we give it and the Y coordinate that we give it, which are done right here. Alrighty, our super class is completed. We only had our constructor and the one method. Let's progress on and we are gonna jump into our player class. So this will be the class used by the person that you will be controlling. This player will inherit our super class. And the only real method that we're gonna put in here is our controls. So all of our events will be placed in here. Remembering that all of our events are actually key down events. So I can say keys equals to key dot get pressed. There we are. What events do we want? So if keys, there we are. And I can begin with the key of key up. I want to do something here. So basically, I want my rect's y position. I want the player's y position to subtract our speed. Now remember, I'm subtracting because pi game starts in the top left. So if I add y, I'm actually going down. When I go up, I'm actually subtracting from the y value. But I don't want my player to leave the screen. So I'm gonna say and, and I'm gonna say my rect y is greater than five. If it's less than five, my player can't go up anymore. We're giving it boundaries. Nice. If our keys, I am now gonna begin with key down, and our y position is less than, let's say the height of the screen, minus the player's height, which is 50. If that's the case, we can take our rect y, and this time we will add speed to it. That brings us to our key, let's say left, and, and this time we are going to put the boundaries on the rect x value, so if the rect x is greater than five, then the player, we can subtract the speed from the player. And our last one is going to be our rect x, whoops, rect x. And let's say is less than the width of the screen minus the player's width again, so 50. If that's the case, then our rect x, we would like to add our speed. To it. That's great. That's all we really needed for our player. It'll be using the super classes method as well as the player method control. Alrighty. We actually have three more classes. So three or four children classes, one super class. In our next class, we need a class for our enemy. Remembering that our enemy will be constantly moving on the screen. So it'll always be moving between two points. So I will say class, we will call this ghost. Ghost is going to inherit from our super again. And I need like a local variable. So it's called a flag. And I can change the value of this flag. And this initial starting point, let's just create a variable called direction. And I will say direction is equal to left. So I'll be able to change this between left and right. And if the direction equals left, I want the ghost to be moving to the left. If it's equal to right, it's going to move in the opposite direction. I can now create a method called update. An update will only take self. And we can say if the rect x of this player is less than or equal to 250, then what we want to do is we want to say the direction that we just made is basically equal to right. Else the direction, nope, the self direction 
is equal to left, like so. That's it. Now, outside of the initial condition, that's going to run and it's going to check what the direction equals. What I can do now is I can make a condition and I can basically say if that direction is equal to left, which is the starting value, then the rect x position, we want it to be moving to the left, like so. Else, we can just take our previous value and our ghost is going to be going to the right. So our condition runs if the x position of our ghost is less than or equal to 250, the direction should be right, else it'll be left. As long as our direction is left, we are going to move left, which is happening here. If we're not moving left, we will be moving right. And this will allow for continuous motion the entire time in our game. That's it. Alrighty. Our final two. Our next class we will actually create will be called coins. Coins does not need to inherit from the super because we don't actually need anything from the super. But we do inherit from the Pygame sprite class. I will create a constructor inside here. And all we need is like a coin X position and a coin Y position. So where are we going to be putting them on the screen? And because we are inheriting that sprite class, I am going to use my super function. For each coin, I need to create a hitbox, a rect for that coin, so we know when we collide with it. To do this, I will say, I will create a property called self.rect, and this is equal to the Pygame class rect. Now, the x and y are our parameters. Coin y, there we go. The width and height of this coin, I want them to be quite small, so 25, 25. Now we'll need an image. So I can go transform, scale, image, load. What image do we want to load? Let's check. Uh, it is going to be $.png. This is the image we want. So $.png will be in there. So I can actually put as a string $.png. Now for the actual value of the coin. So 2525 is like the imaginary hitbox behind it. So for the coin, I could also say 2525. And that will match up perfectly with our rect object. That's all we need. I inherit from the sprite class, and then I created two properties which the coins will need to use as well. Then all we need to do is we need to draw the coins. I need to put the coins on the screen. So we can say the famous screen blit. What do we want to blit? Well, I would like to blit my image. And I would like these to be at my rex value. So we actually made a rex. I just want to target the x value and the y value. Sort of like we've actually done in the past. So I can say self rect x, that'll target the x position, and then self rect y. And that takes the first two positions from this rect class. Brilliant. How are you guys feeling? A lot of classes. We have our super class, our players class with controls, the ghost class, which will keep the ghost in continuous motion. And then we have our coin class. This brings us to the final one. This will be our border class to create the walls. So this one's going to be a bit interesting. So I will create this border class and we can inherit sprite, sprite again. Uh, let's create our constructor. Let's say self. Now, what do we need for this? Well, the walls, the borders, will have a color that I give them. We need to know where each wall is going to go, so their location. And then each wall is going to have a width 
and a height as well. This will allow us to position them exactly where we want them to be on the screen. We can say our super dot init like so. Now we need properties for everything. Now we need properties for all of our parameters and more. So I will create a width property. The value of this will be our width parameter. We can say self.height equals height, that height. Um, we will create an image. Now, I'm not actually putting in a JPEG or PNG. I'm trying to draw something on the screen. So we can use surface, and this allows us to draw a surface onto the screen. And what it takes is a width and height. So I can say self.width and self.height. The object we're drawing will have whatever our properties values are. We can then say, I need an image, right? So I already have my image, which is we just made that. And I want to fill the image with a color. Here I can give my color parameter. So I draw a rectangle in line 60, and then I'm coloring in that rectangle in line 61. I can create a rect value, and I can take that from my image, and we can get rect, like so. Uh, we can create a rect x, and that will be equal to our x value, and a rect y. That's equal to our y value, like so. So our border has a lot going on here. And we won't actually create a whole bunch of methods. We just need one method to draw it. But when we create an object for each wall, we will have to give it a color x, y, width, and height, which can be used in our class. So let's create one called build wall. Now, all build wall is going to do is it's going to allow us to blit the image that we created on the screen. And just like before, we can go self rect x as our x position and uh, self rect y as the y position, like so. Wow, great. So all of our classes are stored here. If you wanna open these up on two pages to see a side by side, that would be great. Now that I'm kinda of done with my module that I've made, I'm going to go back to my main module, because the rest of everything will happen in here. After Pygame, I need to import the module I just made, so I can do that like so. Great. We can jump down now. We have everything going for us. We want to create our objects. So the objects we need, I initially need my player, and he we'll go to the player class. Now our player class takes an image, which if we check our images, I believe it'll be minor, not my knee. Minor PNG. And then we need a starting point for this minor. I want him to start in the top left and it can have a speed of eight, All right? So I have my image, we have the starting position and we have a speed. Then I can create one for ghost, and we can use our ghost class. Now, for our ghost image, we will have our ghost PNG. That is who I want that player to be. The starting point will be 600 and 200, and we can have a speed of the ghost for five. If you want to make it harder, increase your speed. And then, let's see, our coin. I'm going to need a bunch of coins. But before I even get to the coins, what's the goal? We're trying to get to that Bitcoin wallet. So I'll actually create an object called Bitcoin wallet. And this is going to be equal to a player as well. It won't be moving, but it's still an object on our screen. This one is called a oh, Bitcoin PNG. So I'm going to put in here and I'm going to say bitcoin.png, like so. 
I want this wallet to be in the bottom right. So let's go all the way x, let's say y, pretty much to the bottom, with a speed of zero. It's never going to move. Alrighty, so our three objects are here. Now comes the very tedious part, which I would love for you guys to be trying on your own. So I'll do one wall, and then um, the other ones you will have to put at the point in your game where you want them. So design your game. So if we create one like wall one, and that's equal to our border class. Now, the first argument is the color of the wall. And if you remember in our variables, I created one called wall color. This first wall, its X is gonna be 100, its Y is gonna be zero. That's gonna push it against the top of the screen. The width, I want it to take up the rest of the width of the screen. And the height for all the walls, their thickness will be 10, like so. Now it'll be difficult to see, so let's actually get the wall on our screen. But what we're gonna do is, because we're gonna have so many walls, I'm gonna create a list. And after you create one wall, you're gonna add it to your list. And this will make it easier to draw them onto our screen once we have 10 or more walls. Inside my loop now, I'm gonna come down here and I'm just gonna make a loop. And I'm gonna say for wall in my list walls, let's say wall dot build wall, like so. I'm gonna run my application and let's see where the first wall got put to. So it's actually up top right there. You can see a green line. I've made that one there. So I want you guys to spend some time. Pause the video, design your game how you want it. Keep in mind your player is going to be in the top left and the Bitcoin wallet will be in the bottom right. So if you want to pause it now, code out your walls, create your own design. Okay, to save some time, I have actually already spent a good chunk of time programming exactly where I want my walls. All of them are inside my list. When I run my game now, I am going to see all of those walls. There we go. That's the exact setup that I had in the slides, and this is what I went for and I decided on. If you guys have something else, which you should, it should look awesome too. I'm going to close out of that. Okay, if you're struggling, okay, so remember like if I just, I'm going to make a comment here and I'm going to say wall equals border class. We have a color, we have an X position of the wall, a Y position, and we have a width and a height. And that's what each of these values corresponds to. Okay, if you ever forget what's supposed to go in your class, go back to your init and check what do you have inside in it? If you're using that class, that's what you need to give as your arguments. So let me close out. Okay, very nice. Uh, I'm gonna go down here. Now we need to make our coins. So I can basically say here, coin one is equal to our coins class. All we need to give is an X and Y position, but what I want is I want for these coins to be at random positions. So for my X, I'm actually going to say random, and I want it to be randomly anywhere from, let's say, starting at an X of 50, um, let's go up to the width of the screen minus the width of the coin. And then for my Y position, I'm pretty much going to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to say height minus 20, like so. I can take those and I'm going to make, let's say, about eight coins, like so. And all you need to do is go down and change the value of your coins. So coin two, coin three, once we have our coins, I'm going to make a list and I'll call it coins. And inside your list, just like with the walls, I want you to add all of your coins. So coin one, and 
There we are. I have all my coins in my list, which means we can return to our while loop and we can create a for loop to draw these coins on our screen. Let's return and after we drew the walls, I can basically say for every coin in my list coins, we want to take that coin and I want to draw that coin. I'm going to run the program. There we go. All of our coins at a random position for us to collect. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to close out here. Trash the terminal. Uh, let's get some uh, players on our screen. So I'm going to take my player object that I made and I'm going to call the controls method and that'll get him there. I can say ghost and I can call the update method we made for our ghost. Uh, this is really good. And at the end of our if, I'm going to say player.gameEnd, call that method, and I will say player, no not player, I want to say ghost.gameEnd. Uh, let's just make sure the spacing is good for this, like so. Okay, so now that we have our player in the games, and we're calling our two methods that are associated with our player and our ghost, we can kind of move on. So our coins, I want to check if the coin rect object collides with our player, essentially. So I can say player rect. And this was in the notes. Collide rect is checking for two objects that have collided. So if our player touches the coin, what we want to do is I want to take my list and I want to remove that coin from the list. I would like to take my coin sound. Did we make a sound for coin? Yeah, coin sound. I want to trigger that. So I'm going to say coin sound dot play. There we go. And then we can say coin dot kill and this removes it from the screen. I can increase my coin counter, which is down here, because I have now collected one coin. And then we want to take our coin text. Where is our coin text? I want to take this, and I want that to reappear on my screen. So I'm going to paste it like so. Good. Okay. And we have a few more conditions. So our final conditions is we want to check a few things. So if the sprite, if, if our player essentially, if they collide rect with uh, the player, so uh, basically what's happening is I'm checking if our player and our Bitcoin wallet have collided and our coin counter is equal to eight. You need to collect all the coins to win and then you need to get to the wallet. If one of those is not true, it's not gonna happen. I can say end is now equal to true. Not run, but end. And this will allow the game to pause. And then I'm going to blit on my screen the win text that we created earlier. And I can put this kind of right in the middle our last one is I would like to play the sound as well. Very, very nice. I'm going to give this a quick try. There we go. Let's see if my player is working. So my ghost is having a glitch. I'll need to address that. Coins are working how they should, though. We don't have conditions for touching the walls yet. So let's fix that. Um, First thing first, my ghost, something very strange is happening. So I'm actually going to go back to my classes and we're going to go to ghost. So let's see here. Let's see. Uh, direction is left. We have our update. If is less than our direction is right, else self direction left. No. Let's change this. Let's, let's change this. Let's make another if. Let's say if our rect x is greater than or equal to the width of the screen minus the ghost's width, then the direction will become left. There's no else. 
Let's give that another play and see what happens with the ghost this time. Yeah, okay, okay, it's running, it's running. Very nice. So that is all fixed. Great. I will go back to our main. Now in our main, we've pretty much done everything we need to. There's just a few more things. If we touch the walls or the ghost, we pretty much die. So I need to create a condition and I'm gonna check if the sprite collide direct. And inside here, I'm gonna put player and ghost. And so if those two touch. Now here's where it's gonna get long. Or sprite collide rect. Um, if our player and wall one touch. We need to go through and just make a bunch of ors and we need to insert all of our walls. So I'm gonna jump past that part and get all the walls put in here. All right, there we go. So you can see I'm checking if these two objects collide and then I also have all the walls we're checking for. So only one of these needs to be true in order for this condition to run. If that's the case, end is equal to true. Screen, we want to blit the lose text and I will put this at the same rough area. So let's say that and 325. And then we are gonna play lost lose sound. There we go. Okay, okay, very nice. Um, finally, let's get on the screen. Let's get that uh, Bitcoin wallet on the screen. Let's say game end there like so. And if we run it, we should have a full working game. There's just one final part I wanna add on. Coins going up. Maybe bit lagging, I can fix that. If I touch a wall, I lose. I got my lose text. Nothing's happening. It's just frozen on the screen, which is a good, it's a good first step. I wanna now reset the game to its original state. So that would be the final touch there. First thing I'm gonna do is my FPS, where is my FPS? I'm gonna bring that down to like a 30. Well, it's not an action game, it's fine on 30. We can come down to our bottom now and I'm gonna put an else. And this else goes with our condition for if end. I have an else in here. I'm just gonna reset end and I'm gonna say end is now false. I'm gonna say our coin counter is back to zero. For every coin in coins, I want to wipe the screen, kill them off the screen. I can then take my player object and I'll pretty much create a new player here. So you will put in the same exact information as our arguments as we had before. So 35, 50, uh, eight for our speed. And then I want it to basically delay. I don't want it to instantly happen. So I can just say time delay. It's gonna kind of pause the game for a second, for three seconds to be exact. All right, before I give my game a final run, the last thing I want is I need to reset the counter. I've reset the counter, but I want that to reflect in the font as well. So let's go up and let's actually take the coin counter text and I will just put that in here before our delay. Quick overview, we have our else, our conditions for the winning. Oh, let's add win sound. I should have win sound here. There we go. And the rest of our loop. Okay. Our final game run, let's give it a check, play the game a little bit. All right, I'll go through the course. I'd like to get at least one coin here. Oh, this will be tricky. Oh, got it. One coin, okay? I will wait here for the ghost to touch me, and then our game will, there we go, we lose. Okay, very nice. We reset and our coins reset as well. Okay, very nicely done, guys. 
I am so proud of how far we've come, and that was our final game. You should feel very proud. I will see you guys in the closing video.